talking and yakking. I didn't see the <laughs> countdown, so forgive me. But anyway, uh, welcome to First Christian Church this morning. Um, I was looking to see if there's any uh, uh, announcements that we needed to mention. Just read the ones that are in your bulletin. One that I want to uh, announce is that we're kind of revamping our missions team, and we are asking that anybody who may have a heart for missions uh, male or female, we are interested in you being on this team with us. We're going to meet once a month, and we will be praying for the different missions and just discussing ways that we can be a blessing to them. So, um, get in touch with me if you're interested in that. And once again, uh, we just want mission-minded, praying people. So, if you are a lady, feel free to, uh, to let me know. We would love to have you. Brian, you got anything to say, brother? Well, I was approached this morning, um, tonight's potluck, could you mention that? Ooh, we're going to eat tonight. Yeah. If we eat tonight. That's an important announcement. <laughs> Shirley, uh, would like, uh, if, uh, if, would you need any help tonight, Shirley? Let's... I don't think so. If, okay. if I don't get it done and Darwin shows up, he can help. Okay. <laughs> All right. If you want to help with anything, ask Shirley. Other than that, just uh, show up tonight for a, a potluck, and then we'll be watching the uh, third, ep fourth episode of, uh, of The Chosen. 
wonderful series and all. So, any other announcements? All righty. Do we have a uh, scripture? Okay, if you would stand with me and we'll read our scripture in the day. It's 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for just giving us the opportunity to be here this morning and in this building that we can worship you, Father, with others that love you. Father, we just pray that your presence, your Holy Spirit will be here and that it will lead us in everything that we do. Father, we just pray that our, our worship will just put a smile on your face. And Father, even as we leave here, we just pray that our hearts are open and that your presence, your Holy Spirit, will go with us and direct our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Okay, let's let's begin, JJ. Thank you. 
We've all heard that saying, you are what you eat. And to a very true extent, we are. I mean, you, you think about the preservatives and the uh, processes and all the things that we put into our bodies. We're unhealthier now than we ever have been. But this isn't just merely true in a physical sense. It's also true in a spiritual sense. And this is a concept that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God told Adam and Eve, you may have any tree, any plant that bears fruit for food except for one tree. For in so eating this, you will surely die. And Adam and Eve, in their disobedience, ate of the fruit, became creatures in rebellion against God. And so physically, eventually, their, their bodies, which were meant to be immortal, died. So fast forward a little bit. When God is rescuing his people, Israel, from slavery uh, in the book of Exodus, and sure enough, they sacrificed the Passover lamb. But part of that salvation was, of course, painting the blood, but also the feast that happened inside the home where those who were saved held their refuge. When the tabernacle was established and temple sacrifice established, a part of that sacrifice was a feast, a feast of what was sacrificed. The feast was a reminder that God can save and that we are eating and ingesting God's salvation when he had poured out his wrath on an innocent sacrifice. Jesus took this a step further. As a matter of fact, I would say Jesus took this a hundred miles further. In John chapter 6, it says in verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, because you ate your fill of the loaves. You see, Jesus had just performed a miracle of immense proportion. He fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. But he goes on to say in verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. You see, Jesus isn't merely talking about the, the loaves and the fish they had just eaten. He's also speaking of the sacrificial system in which they lived that could no longer save them. They couldn't be saved by the daily sacrifice. The author of Hebrews says that in that old system, the, the priests would have to sacrifice daily, but Christ did so once and for all. Amen. Verse 29, Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. And so they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is that bread. And we come here because the sacrifice has been made. That God himself could see that even in our best acts of righteousness, we could not be good enough on our own. That our righteousness could not ever live up to his standards. And so at the cross, God made the sacrifice. And we gather here to eat of that sacrifice. Not that this bread is physically Jesus' flesh, as some believe. But we come gathering to become like him because we are what we eat. At the supper table, when Jesus passed it, he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given to you.
And then he passed the cup. He said, take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, which is paid as a ransom for many. This shouldn't be merely something that, as some say, this transforms into Christ's body and blood. No, it should be something that as we eat it, transforms us into Christ's body, saved by his blood. And this is why we gather at this table every week. We gather not because we're righteous, but because he is. We eat not because we're righteous, but because he is transforming us into his image. And I want to challenge you today, no matter what else is done here or said here, don't leave the same as when you came, having eaten this bread and this cup. by grace, the grace that you give us, Lord Heavenly Father, the chance that we can come around this table, Lord Heavenly Father, and partake of these emblems, Lord Heavenly Father, this emblem of the, of the bread that, that we take upon us, that, that we eat of your body, Lord Heavenly Father, as we remember the sacrifice that was given upon the cross as they whip and try to destroy your body, Lord, and your Father. Lord, just to be with us as we partake of this, and we ask forgiveness of our sins. Lord God, we would be Jesus Christ our Savior. Dear Heavenly Father, we just continue our prayer to you, thanking you for this day, and thanking you, Father, for all the many, many blessings that you have provided. So thankful, Father, for your love, for your Knowing, Father, that you are the true God, the living God, and the only God, and that you loved us so much, Father, that you provided your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, uh, that he served here and came here to this earth and uh, went to the cruel cross of Calvary. And we just pray, Father, that we take of this uh, loaf and this cup, which represents the body and, and blood that Jesus shed 
the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At this time, I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Good? Are we sure about that? How are you doing? Jacob, it's been such a long time. No, I'm just kidding. I saw Jacob. We spent a whole week together at camp. Now, I want to ask y'all a question. I, I'm not, I want to, I want to see if any of our camp, campers can do this. Can somebody tell me the good news this morning? How about, you, you guys want to stand up and say it together? Okay. Well, Tristan, I want you to listen to this and then I'm going to, I'm going to help you learn it. Okay. So can you say it as loud as you can? Okay. Let's try it. So what, what did Jesus do? Why did Jesus tell us we need to be born again, do you think? What's wrong with the first? You know, you tell me, Tristan. Why do we need to be born again? You just think about it. Why do we need to be born again? Somebody tell me. Go ahead, Finn. Well, how about this? I'm going to ask you a question, a very serious question. How many of you like cookies? It's a serious question. How many of y'all have parents that bake homemade cookies sometimes? And how many of y'all, when told, don't eat these cookies, can only think about the cookies? Who's ever snuck a cookie you weren't supposed to take before? I'm going to raise my hand on that one. So I want you all to think about that. Sometimes we do things we're not supposed to do. The Bible tells us we're all born into sin. And so that's why we do the things that we're not supposed to do is because God's perfect order was broken. And so we do these things and we we steal cookies and we fight with our siblings and we do all sorts of things that even sometimes we don't want to do but we just find ourselves doing it right and so Jesus says we have to be born again so he can give us a new heart a heart that is free from the burdens of sin to help us become like him in the way he wants us to be does that make sense and so Jesus when he came to die we become reborn so he can restore that order that he created in the beginning that we sort of broke. Does that make sense? So today, as you, as you go to your Bible lesson, we're going to have Miss Michaeline and, and we've got some others to, to do the, the nursery for the younger ones. As you go to your Bible lessons today, thank you for holding on to that for me, son. 
As we do our Bible lessons today, I want you to think about that. Am I being acting like I'm born again, or am I still living in the old way that Jesus came to save me from? Thank you for holding on to that for me. All right, well, I love you guys. We'll see y'all soon, and I hope y'all have a good lesson. So the younger ones, go ahead and go. Uh, <laughs> go over there. The older ones go with Miss Mike. All right, y'all. Please keep me in prayer throughout this service because I am literally at the end of my rope, so that means God has to show up. Two weeks of camp will drain somebody. Sometimes I felt at camp that I was more of a counselor for the counselors, especially during elementary week for some reason. I felt like I was more of a counselor for the counselors than I was for the, the kids, but I'm going to tell you something. No matter how bad I think things went, no matter if things didn't go my way, they were always going God's way. We saw, in spite of how I felt, just pulling my hair out, I didn't have much to go off of. We saw, this last week, 15 decisions for Jesus Christ. We saw kids who had been talking about baptism for weeks with their parents at home. And, and what's more is, I was able to connect with some parents who are local to our church who I'd never met before but was able to baptize their daughter and found out that her father had been talking about baptism with his daughter for weeks before she came to church came up. God is moving in spite of us. We don't need to be the ones in control because he is. We don't have to have everything all together because he is making all things new. But see, the thing is, I think sometimes in our desire to put things in order, we can sometimes speak and tell God, I don't need you. I know how to make this happen. This was happening in the church in Corinth. There were all sorts of things going on. They, they were forsaking the teachings that, that Paul had taught them. And so Paul had to write this letter, which... Quite frankly, having worked with the teenagers I did this week, I didn't want to have those conversations I wanted with them. I'm fairly certain Paul didn't want this conversation with them, but it had to happen. Why? Because God, when he calls us to himself, when we're baptized and born again, we're not given leave to do whatever we want. What is Paul writing? Uh, Romans chapter 6. Should I continue sinning so that grace may abound even more? By no means. He also says in Romans 12. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that by testing. You may know what God's will is. What is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, sometimes I think what happens is on our road to spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity is a lot like physical maturity. We begin at the baptistry or we begin at the river or wherever it was that, that we were born again. We begin as spiritual infants. And spiritually speaking, we know as much as infants. Which is to say not much, if anything at all. Infants know when they're hungry. How do I know they cry? Infants know when they're thirsty or when they're wet. How do I know they cry? We know when they're tired. How do we know they cry? But unfortunately, as a parent, <laughs> it's frustrating because when you're brand new at it, you have to figure out what each cry means. In the same way, as we grow spiritually, we don't always know what we need. But then there's the spiritual childhood. Spiritual childhood, you're more independent of thought and action, and you can begin to do things on your own, but you still need the guidance of someone older than you to teach and train you as you grow and become an adult. And in that guidance, it's frustrating sometimes. Why? Because kids get into things they ought not to get into. Any parents give me an amen on that one? And that's what they do. That's what we do spiritually. 
I see it all the time all over social media. A bunch of people who may have been in church their whole lives but never grew past the childhood phase. Because we begin to believe anything that sounds spiritual but is not scriptural. And if we do not have the guidance of those who are older than us, what does the Bible say? We are tossed about by every wind of doctrine. It's only the gospel of Jesus Christ through his word that we must stand firm. But a lot of people never grow past that. And then there's the other phase that most of us don't like in the physical humans as well as in the spiritual humans. Teenagehood. Because teenagers know everything. You can't tell a teenager anything. And I see some wives looking at husbands saying, you probably never grew out of that one either. <laughs> teenagers, basically all you can do is love them and hope you don't destroy them before they can become fully mature. And so you have to be patient. Because at the teenage phase is the most exciting phase. Why? Because they do figure things out. Because those of us who have survived our teenage years, which if you're an adult in the room today, I'm assuming you have, we gain a lot of wisdom through that. And we begin to grow and spiritually mature. And then when we get to that age where we do, we start to become spiritual parents as we use that wisdom that God has given us through both his word, the Holy Spirit, and our experiences. We raise and train them. And after a while, we get the best part to become spiritual grandparents when all of our spiritual children start doing the same. But it's a process. A lot of us want to treat that uh, journey from uh, uh, being baptized to spiritual maturity, maturity like a sprint. But it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's hard. You can tell I don't run marathons because they're hard. I don't know who would willingly, and no offense to you if you're one of them, but who would willingly say, yes, it sounds exciting to sacrifice my body and run 25 miles. God bless you. That ain't me. But the Christian walk is a marathon. It's our whole life. It's God through the Holy Spirit and his word building and shaping us and pruning us and trimming us uh, of all those things that are not of him. In James, James almost gives us this image of, of a uh, smelter. And I don't know about y'all, but smelting is, is something that fascinates me. See, what they would do back in, in ancient times is they would get this big black kettle that could endure intense heat. And they would throw all their raw materials into it and melt it down. I don't know about y'all, but being melted doesn't sound pleasant to me. And here's what the silversmiths would do. is all the dross, all the impurity would bubble up to the top and they'd scrape that off. And they would repeat this process over and over and over again. Until the silver was pure. And the silversmith knew that it was pure when he could look into the surface of this bubbling raw silver and see his face reflected in it. You see what the Lord is doing to us. He's melting away the impurities. He's melting away the things of this world that are, are, are hindering our walk with him. He's scraping off all that dross because at the end of our lives, what he desires to see, even now, what he desires to see is his face reflected back from us. In the beginning, he made man in his image. And he sent his son to die to restore that image. Amen. Last week, we talked a little bit about this, how we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and God desires purity in his temple. As a matter of fact, reading through the Old Testament prophets, I promise if you do that, I want to encourage you. Read the entire counsel of God. There are some preachers that are preaching we don't need to, or we need to unhitch ourselves from the Ten Commandments. We need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. I'm going to tell you, in reading the Old Testament, I understand the New Testament far better because I can see God's heart. But in the Old Testament prophets, God's biggest offense was the temple was not doing its job. The priests were allowing idolatry. They were setting up idolatry in the, or idols within the sacred spaces. They were neglecting the poor and the foreigner and the outcast. 
They were neglecting the orphans and the widows. At this, there was a special tithe to be given year after year just for the purpose of taking care of the downtrodden. And the shepherds of Israel, as Ezekiel said, were eating the sheep. Church, I'm going to give you all a secret. Yes, we do have shepherds and overseers within the church. But according to the book of Hebrews, you, as well as I, as well as the elders, as well as the deacons, are all a royal priesthood. Every single one of us are those priests. And we are all obliged to the one who saved us so that we might do service to him and draw others to him and bring others to him. And as priests, I'm going to say this, it requires sacrifice of all of us. It means giving up our fleshly desires. Maybe the things that we would like to do for the sake of this. And I'm going to tell you how this has crept in. When I was serving at a church once, Wednesday night youth was important. It is here too. But this was the biggest thing because every other day of the week, guess what was going on? Apart from Sundays and even on Sundays, sports. It had taken over. I'm not sure anyone's familiar with that. But it had taken over our lives. And so when I was approached by the, the leader of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes to start a chapter on Wednesday nights, I was one of the few preachers in town who, bu who buffed up against it. I said, I enjoy the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. I love the Christian Athletes and I will support them. However, a club does not take the place of church. I was by my fellow colleagues in town who usually were very respectful. They really didn't like me. As a matter of fact, they cut me out of any conversations they had on the subject. Here's what we've done. We as a church, and I'm not speaking here per se, but in general, the church at large, we've made so many concessions with the world. And the world keeps asking and asking and asking, and they will never give anything back to us. And if we cannot maintain the purity of the church, if we cannot keep the sacred things in sacred spaces, and by the way, y'all, you are sacred. Then God, as he said to the churches in Revelation, will remove our lampstand from before him. He is the head of the church. He is its author and its designer. And we have to do things his way, not our way. And so after speaking of that holy temple, the next place God draws his attention to in the church in Corinth through the Apostle Paul is the home. Now concerning the matters about which he wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptations of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Back then, some in the church brought this false teaching that people shouldn't get married. They thought it was sinful to get married. And as a matter of fact, if you read through the New Testament, you find it's a common theme. These people called super apostles who were wealthy and good looking and, and all sorts. Does that sound familiar to anyone? They taught a gospel of prosperity. And the only ones prospering were them. They were teaching these teachings in the church and making money off the tithes. But Paul says, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give his, to his wife the conjugal rights and likewise the husband to her, uh, the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Now, I'm going to tell you all something in church. For a long time, we've stopped right there. But let's listen to what Paul says. Likewise, the husband does not have the authority over his own body, but the wife does. What does this mean? In the home, husbands and wives sacrifice for one another. Amen. They love each other. They wash one another's feet. 
It's just like Ephesians 5, verse 22. Many husbands have stopped at that little section where it says, Wives, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. That settles it. It's done. But what does Paul say to the husbands just a short stretch later? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What act of submission could be greater than that? Love your wives as Christ loved the church. Literally, he died for them. Husbands, we need to die for our wives as our wives submit to us. It's a cycle that shows the love of God and his people. You see, Satan, after attacking sexual purity, attacks the home. And most of the problems we have today in our society are because homes are broken. Amen. Every community across this nation is facing it. I don't care what ethnicity you come from or whatever your social background is, whether rich, poor, black, white, Mexican, whatever. The problem of most of what we see is the lack of fathers within the home. Amen. And God wants there to be unity between the husband and the wife. What does it say in Genesis? Therefore, a father or a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave or become one or join with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Paul says this in Ephesians. This is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ in the church. Unity in the home speaks of unity between God and man. And there's three things I believe that show the power of God far above the miracles ever could. Unity, because true unity in, in our day and age requires a contract, doesn't it? To be certified by witnesses, and if it's broken, there's certain legal ramifications to it. But true Christian unity is one that is done out of love. Yeah. And unity is also born through that second thing, and we'll get to love in, in a minute. Obedience. There is no higher form of love that exists apart from obedience. Obedience requires me to give up my rights for the sake of God and others. And in marriage, obedience requires me to love my wife. And I know my wife's a godly woman because she loves me in spite of myself. And the last thing that is miraculous is love. Because love is not natural apart from self-love. We live in a society that preaches and teaches, follow your heart. But Jeremiah tells us the heart is wicked above all else. Who can know it? True love is always sacrificial. How do I know that? My God is sacrificial. God made everything and called the world Good, And he looked at all he had made and he called it very good. And yet, when his creation rebelled against him, God took some of his very good world and he sacrificed and he clothed Adam and Eve's not only their nakedness, but their shame by the blood of a sacrifice. God did. You see, the very first relationship that was broken before the relationship between God and man was the relationship between Adam and his wife. They were naked and unashamed and their eyes were open and they hid themselves and hid from each other. Then they heard the sound of God walking through the garden and so what did they do? They hid from God. And so God, through Christ, wants to restore the proper order of things. This is why sexual purity is so important. And I know we've talked about this two weeks in a row, but Paul literally spends two and a half chapters on it. It's important for us to realize that our marriages are under attack and that God is going to teach or is trying to teach us what true marriage is like. What the world has taught us about sex is this, is that sex is transactional. And I don't, I don't know how 
many little girls I've had to counsel over the years, and I'm not talking teenagers, I'm talking 11, 12, and 13 year olds who think that in order for them to be loved in life, they need to throw their bodies at boys. And the world teaches this through music, the world teaches through movies, through social media, and even through children's shows. We are inundated with this, and we've stopped talking about this in the church. Sex is not transactional. Sex is a sacred gift between man and woman in the context of marriage. God has given it, and we need to take it back. Amen. But it has to start with a godly marriage. It has to start with me as a husband. And my wife, as a wife, saying, we're not going to use this against each other. You get this if you're good. You don't if you're bad. And so Paul says, don't hold back. He goes on, do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul recognizes this about us, too, is we're beings who lack self-control. If we had self-control, naturally, Christ need not have gone to the cross. And so I'm going to admonish those of us who are married. Don't. Worry, this is also have stuff for single folks too. We need to make sure that we are protecting our marriage, every aspect of our marriage. We are sacrificing in our marriage, every aspect of our marriage. Husbands, sacrifice for your wives. Wives, sacrifice for your husband. Unless you, as Paul says, have an agreement to abstain, to grow closer to God. Protect your marriage. This is where Satan attacks it first. I'm not sure if any of y'all have heard it, but there's a song called Slow Fade. It's one of my favorite songs. And one of the lines of the song says, Daddies never crumble in a day. People never crumble in a day. Marriages never crumble in a day. And I'm going to tell y'all, it takes two to tango. Or it takes two to stop dancing. We need to protect our marriages. We need to fight for our marriages. We need to fight for purity within our marriages. We need to turn the images off that are seeking to pull us away from purity in our, in our marriages. We need to shut the voices of the world out and only let the voice of God into our marriages. Otherwise, we are doing exactly what the world is doing and showing the world that God is not in marriage. Paul writes, now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of a kind, or one of one kind and one of another. What's he mean? Paul is celebrating his celibacy, his singleness. And he's not saying that it's bad for someone to be single and it's good for someone to be married. That's not what he's saying at all. He's trying to let you know that. If you're single this morning, wonderful. You have more opportunities as a single person than many do as married couples. You see, a, a single person could pick up and go on a mission trip pretty quickly. But a married person who has a husband or a wife or, or kids at home, what do we have to do? We have to make concessions for them. We have to make sure we have insurance in case something happens to us. So that our family will be fed and provided for if something should, God forbid, happen. We have to make sure that while we are gone, that, that they have plenty of food, water, shelter, security. All those things. And Paul wishes that everyone could be like him, but he's not saying. He's saying that if you're married, it's a gift. And if you're single, it's a gift. Love the gift that God has given you. To the unmarried and the widows, verse 8, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to be married than to burn with passion. You see, Paul is also saying, just like he said in the previous chapter and the chapter before, that sex is a gift of God and should not be used for anything else but between a man and a wife because that is God's gift to them. Amen. So if you're burning with passion, get married. There's no need to try it on. Do things the way God planned and watch how God will bless it. Verse 10, to the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, 
But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Part of this had to do with that teaching we spoke of earlier. These false teachers were coming into the churches at Corinth and saying that you shouldn't be married. And so people were divorcing, people were separating because they thought that was what God wanted. But the other part of that is that marriage, again, is sacred. Nowadays, people use marriages, especially if you look at the celebrity world, marriages are, are, are like a box of tissue paper. And I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm tired of hearing this from people. Well, my aunt, who has been married 20 times, is a, mar is, a, is a marriage counselor and an expert on it. I'm sorry, but if you've been married 20 times, you're not an expert on marriage. The expert on marriage is the person who said, I do, and stayed there. Now, don't get me wrong. I said it earlier, it takes two to tango, and Paul will address this a little later. And Jesus addressed this. Marital unfaithfulness is a grounds for divorce. But I'm going to tell you, it's not an unforgivable sin in marriage. I've seen marriages recover from it. Because with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's not to say that this isn't a subject that we need to take lightly. Divorce is hurtful. Someone explained it to me this way. It's like I, I like to work with wood. Taking two pieces of wood that you glued together with a, a strong, like a gorilla glue. And then after they've been joined together and fused together for a time, trying to rip them apart, you're not going to get two whole pieces of wood. There will be pieces of the other bonded forever with those pieces. It's messy. It's hurtful. It breaks families. And it breaks God's heart. But here, if there's a reason for separation, see that there's reconciliation, if at all possible. Some in this room have been married and divorced and remarried. I'm not going to, to speak on, on your situation. You have to, to look between you and God. But what I want to say is whichever marriage you're on right now, treat it as sacred. Grace covers a multitude of sin, and this is not unforgivable. Treat your marriage as sacred. Uphold it in honor. Because if you don't treat your marriage as sacred, your kids after you won't treat it as sacred. Your neighbors who look to you as a Christian won't look at it as sacred. And even though the, old, the whole world goes to pot, as long as we stand firm on God's foundation and fight for marriage, we will at least hear the words, well done. Amen. And I love this. Paul addresses those who are single. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord. So what's Paul saying? Here's my opinion on the matter. That if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of the wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, her children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. What does holy mean? Set apart. Sacred to God. Even if your marriage, you feel, we've heard this expression, and it is biblical, not being unequally yoked. Even should you feel your marriage is unequally yoked, but your husband or your wife consents to live with you, Paul says, God bless you. Keep praying for your husband. Keep submitting to him as unto the Lord. Keep praying for your wife. Keep dying for her as Christ loved the church. For your action may sanctify her that she may be saved. Or your submission may sanctify him that he may be saved. And you know what? In my years of preaching, I've seen it happen. As a matter of fact, I've seen it happen after 40 years of marriage. I've seen it happen. <laughs> Some of the most unlikely circumstances. Keep loving as Christ loved the church. And it also makes your children holy. Now listen to this. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. 
In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you shall save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So if they want to leave, let them go. It's not a sin to. But I'll tell you what, Lee Strobel, one of the most powerful preachers from the 80s, his wife came to church. She thought the party was over. She dared him <laughs> to prove Christ wrong. And what happened? He went from drinking, living a, a high society life as a hot shop newspaper reporter, to becoming a preacher and a minister of the gospel who to this day has a strong ministry. And his children have grown up in ministry and have become themselves involved in ministry. You don't know. Don't give up. Until God gives you that moment that it's over. Verse 17 says, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him. And to which God has called him. This is my rule for all the churches. In other words, if you're single, enjoy the moment that God has given you. If you're married, enjoy the moment that God has given you. Why? Because everything is a gift of God. What does it say in Scripture? He makes everything beautiful in its own time. And I'm going to tell this too. Those of us who are married, looking at young single people, we need to stop asking the question, when are you going to get married? Because you don't know how damaging that can be. I know that a lot of us love people. But everyone's struggling differently. If someone is single, say, how is the Lord using you? How is your walk with Jesus? Support them in their singleness. Why? Paul gives us some reason. Listen to this. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. In other words, was he Jewish? Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. And he's equating all this with marriage and sexuality. If you're not married, it's okay. If you're married, it's okay. If you're not Jewish, it's okay. If you're Jewish, it's okay. Don't cast any of that off. It's who God called you to be. God designed you and called you at your time of your calling for a specific purpose, which is to give him honor and glory. And so whether Jew or Gentile, or whether married or unmarried, you can give God glory in everything you do. Just make sure you're giving God glory. Now listen to this. Each one should remain in the condition which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, avail yourself to the opportunity. For he who is called the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he was free when he is called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever conditions each was called, let him remain with God. In other words, don't enslave yourselves to the world. These days it's easy to complain about everything, isn't it? <laughs> I see young people complaining about marriage laws. I see them complaining about not just young people, but older people are getting in on this too. But complaining about unfair work conditions. We're losing work ethic. We're losing all sorts of things. But if you look at it, Paul brings that first starting with purity. Then in marriage, and then in conduct. You see, when we're willing to compromise in one thing, it's easy to keep on going. I don't know how many times I've had someone in my office weeping say, I don't know how I got to this point. Feeling so far gone that God could never bring them back. But what it all boils down to is compromise. Which is why we need to remain pure. Which is why if we are married, we need to fight for our marriage. Which is why whatever state, if we were Jew or Gentile, we need to stay in the purity in which God has called us. In the context in which God has called us. Which is why whether we are workers or we are businessmen or we are slaves or we are free, whatever the case may be, we need to live as we are called. 
And he goes on to this. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think in the view, now notice he's saying I think. These are opinions. In view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is, meaning single. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. So if you're engaged, don't break off the engagement. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you've not sinned. Why did Paul say all these things? Because he knew the Lord is coming back. He saw the urgency of the gospel, and he wanted everyone to go and preach the gospel. Now, if we're married, he gives us a reason for why he believes what he does. He says, if a, if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I would spare you of that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they are not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Now, if you go on to other books of the Bible, like Titus, Titus is encouraging people to get married. He's not contradicting himself, but he's letting us know that every decision we have, we need to weigh with the urgency of the gospel. Because even though this was written 2,000 more or less years ago, the world is still passing away. And those of us who are here today may not be here tomorrow. Do we have an urgency for the gospel? How many of y'all, I, I, I sat with a young preacher who just was weeping one day. Because his best friend had taken his own life. And he said, I wish I would have told him. I wish I could have just one more moment to let him know how much he is loved by God. And now I don't have that experience anymore. I don't have that option anymore. I don't have that choice anymore. You see, Paul is saying that those who are married, we have other cares and concerns. We've got to be concerned with our marriages. Why? Because that's the first ministry that God has given us. As a preacher, no offense, your first or my first ministry is not you. It's to my wife and to my children. Amen. I do have those concerns. But those of you who are single, you don't have the concerns that I do. You have freedom to preach that gospel message because there is a world out there who is desperately looking for light in darkness. There are young men and young women who are trading their bodies for eternity, for the look of belonging, the appearance of belonging. And maybe you're the one called to go to speak. There are people who are hurting and who are suffering. That sometimes because of the troubles I have as a husband, I can't go to right away. But maybe you can. He says this. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives... Oh, I've already read that. I apologize. Verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord. But to be holy in body and spirit... But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. You see, what Paul desires of all of us, the married and the unmarried alike, is complete attention upon the Lord. And something that can happen even within marriage is we can set up our marriages as idols next to the cross. We can set up our children as idols next to the cross. We can set up 
anything really our jobs next to the cross i don't know how many times i've seen people and i'm not going to say that coming to the church gathering on sunday is the essence of salvation but i don't know how many times i've seen people skip church to say well you know what i wanted to give my kids experiences that i never had that's great but once you start missing church and you teach your children it's okay to miss church it's easier and easier and easier and easier to do after a while you won't miss church at all but it will miss you. We need to fix our minds on the things of God. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Everything else becomes worldly. Our marriages are sacred to God, yes, but they are a gift. We need to not worship the gift, but the giver of the gift. And we worship Him by loving responsibly. Now listen to this. If anyone thinks he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passions are very strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So that he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Paul is merely speaking of distractions. He's not saying it's a sin to get married. As a matter of fact, he began this chapter with such words. But he wants us to have our priorities in order. Verse 39, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Again, if you remarry, keep it sacred. Yet, in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I, too, have the Spirit of God. I want you all to know, Paul says up front that that's his opinion. He says what comes from the Lord and what comes from him. But I want you all to know something, that he does agree on this, that we can agree on this, that all his letters agree on this. We have to fight for what God has established. We have to fight to keep our marriages sacred and holy. Because sacred and holy marriages raise sacred and holy children who are set apart for the good works of God. And if you are single, that's all right. It's not something to be lamented over. Don't feel the pressures of, of people who are married saying, when are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? I know you feel the weight of it. And sometimes in church, it feels like we tout marriage over singleness. But Paul is saying that singleness is sacred too. Jesus even said this, there are some who are eunuchs spiritually, meaning that they have no desire to be married, and that's all right. Jesus himself was one of these. He never got married, even though as a Jewish boy he could have been obligated to. But someday we will be married with him. You see, the church is his bride, which is why marriage is held so sacred. Because godly marriages speak of Christ and the church. And if you are not going to be married physically on this earth, treat your life as if you are married to Christ. That is sacred and holy. I've known people who my whole lives have never been able to get married or have kids or anything like that. It's just never been on the books. But the amazing things they were able to do for God. Whatever you do, in marriage or in singleness, devote your life to God. That's the point. That's what God is calling us to. That's what Paul is calling the church to. That's his opinion. But we need to stop making marriage a light or a trivial thing. We need to stand firm upon the things that God has established. We need to fight for the things that God has established. And yes, we need to die for the things that God has established. But whatever we do, we cannot profane what God has made sacred. So as I call Brother Wes up, I'm going to do a different invitation than I've done today. I'm going to invite you all to stand with me. What I want to do just for a little while, until Brother Wes feels the need to, to close us in song. 
I want us to close our eyes. This was in the Psalms called the Selah moment, which means to pause and reflect. Let's close our eyes as one church and pause and reflect on the Word of God. Thank you.